Hey everyone, welcome back. This is week 42 of Creative Come Follow Me for the New Testament. And this week we're in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. So this is that pocket of saints that Paul and Silas visited. You guys remember when we were studying back in Acts, they were starting to grow the church there. And then there was a bit of an uproar because they had turned things upside down. You can go in the Come Follow Me manual and read that introductory paragraph and learn more about it. But they get pulled out earlier than they hoped almost like a missionary that gets transferred sort of unexpectedly and then worries about the saints he's leaving behind because there are lessons yet to be taught and there are doctrines that he didn't quite clarify. I think that's where Paul is. He, he has hope for these saints, but he's worried because he knows he had to leave things unfinished. So in these chapters, you're going to see him send Timothy back to check on these saints. And the report that comes back is surprisingly good. Timothy is comes back with good news that the saints are doing well, things are thriving, but they have a lot of questions. What I liked about this week's study, first off, I really like that this is the beginning. Most people, at least the scholars that I studied, said that these chapters, especially what you find in 1 Thessalonians, are the, some of the earliest writings that we have of Paul, which means this is like within... 15 years of the Savior's crucifixion. Maybe, you know, 20 years later, the Gospels are written. This is the first writing that we have that witnesses about the incredible wonder of Jesus Christ. Like, I think there's power in knowing this is what we have first. The other thing I like is I feel like Paul's trying to help us understand how to approach people with questions. All of us are in this Gospel with an incomplete picture, right? We, we are building in faith, trying to understand the fullness of the gospel. And we don't have all the pieces at first. And we, when we do get a piece, we're trying to shift it around to figure out where it fits. And that's what's happening with these saints. And so I feel like when you study Paul and the way he teaches them, what he focuses on, how he approaches things, I feel like it helps us know how to help those with questions. Because a lot of us, either ourselves or people that we love, are wrestling with questions. So I think learning how to approach questions, learning how to handle them better is something we all need. And you'll find that today in Paul. His whole message is that he hopes to perfect what is lacking. He knows he had to leave in a hurry and he wants to give them what is missing. And so you're going to find a lot of that in these verses. He's going to teach them more fundamentally about the second coming. He's going to teach them about discipleship and how to access things on their own. I think Paul knows the likelihood of him being able to go back and stay with those in this town are not high. So instead, he focuses on what he can do from a distance. And what he can do is to teach them how they can find revelation for themselves, how they can learn as a community and individually how to come closer to Christ. And so since all of us need that same guidance in our life, I think there's a lot to learn. So grab your scriptures, grab your notes. It's time to get started. I really love that the first verse of all published scripture in the New Testament focuses brightly on God the Father and Jesus Christ. I think you see that pattern over and over again. The first gospel that was published, when you look at Mark, you see that same sentiment, the same message about Jesus Christ. When you go on the Doctrine and Covenants, you see that same message or in introduction to the Book of Mormon. That's There is this resounding pattern about what scripture is for, that it is designed to bring us closer to our Father in heaven, through the grace of Jesus Christ. And I, I love that Paul begins there. Then he goes on to compliment the saints. So if you look in three, he says, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father, knowing beloved brethren, brethren beloved, your election of God. He reminds them, I think, who they are to God and how much God loves them. It's not just a, an epistle to say, here's who we worship and how great he is. It's an epistle to say, God loves you back. I think that's what we heard in conference over and over again, that we heard the attributes of God and we came to understand more about our Father in heaven and Jesus Christ. But we also got a message of how much they love us and are rooting for us and giving us tools to be successful. That's Paul's message too. In fact, two of the tools he mentions are found in five. I love the way he phrased it. He says, for our gospel came not unto you in word, not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in as much assurance as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. That combination of word and Holy Ghost is a powerful one. It is a converting 
power punch. You know, like I think if you come to a class, there's a great quote in the notes from Elder Holland, where he talks about being a good teacher and that to really be effective in your teaching, you need both of these things. You need to study the word as much as you can. Go in written scripture, go in conference talks, learn as much as you can, and then come to class with the intent to speak by the power of the Holy Ghost. Meaning the Holy Ghost will tell you of all those things you studied, which are the most important or which ones to focus on or what thoughts are in your students' minds that you need to draw out. I think you need word and power. I think it also is really instrumental in our own testimonies. It's one thing to study the word and to understand the history and the context context of the scriptures and try to be a better scriptorian, but it's never going to be enough unless we add in the gift of the Holy Ghost, where we start to see between the lines and we start to see how these verses apply to us. I just think that's where the power for me comes in. So he, he mentions that to these saints as well. Then he talks about how he's proud of them for being an example. I love the way it's phrased. So he says in seven, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. I think this is him saying like, you are shining so brightly, even though you have an imperfect testimony, meaning like they don't have all the pieces yet. They don't know all the details yet. They just know enough to beam out brightness. And it's so bright that others are coming in. I think it's what you see all the time with those who come to the church, that even though they have an imperfect understanding of all the different parts of the principles of the gospel, they are on fire. You know, like I remember how I told you guys that I have one of my YSAs who's a recent convert to the church and she came to class last week with somebody else that she was bringing in. And when I talked to her about it and thanked her for bringing somebody to class, she's like, I'm just doing my new calling. I'm a ward missionary. This is what I do. And what I loved about that is she's only been a baptized member of the church for a couple months. I know there are things she doesn't know and understand yet, but she knows it's good. And so she teaches and she opens up. And I feel like that's what Paul is saying. It takes courage to stand and testify when you have an imperfect understanding. But there's power when you do. You can pull people in like a magnet because of that vulnerability you're sharing. I just think is what you see in all those who are new to the faith. Even if you're not a new member of the faith, but you're just reigniting your testimony, I think that that pulls people in. So he's complimenting him on that. And then he talks about how far reaching they are. So in eight, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad so that we not speak to anything. What's great about this is I think this is a teacher's dream, right? That, that the students will be so engaged that they go beyond, you know, they, they spread the message to others. For a couple of years, I think three or four, three years, I was a church service missionary for Family Search. And one of the jobs we had as a missionary was to put on this, um, it was kind of a conference for women who were just beginning to learn family history. We called it Light Keepers. And it was a fantastic experience. But I have to tell you, one of my happiest moments with that Light Keepers experience, teaching this conference over and over again, was when I got a call from my sister, Sarah, who was going to host her own in her stake. You know, she'd come to ours and she'd learned the fundamentals and she was so on fire with family history, both from things she learned before she ever came to our class and from the things she learned in our class that she was like, I want to, I want to take this out to my stake. I want other people to learn it. And it was so fulfilling. You know, you could just see the work of the spirit going through you towards others. And it was, I, I, I felt like an instrument, you know, like it was one of those times where you just feel joy because you see things rolling out. And I think that's how Paul feels when he hears about the work that they're doing in this, you know, incomplete understanding of the gospel, they are helping bring other people in. And so he talks about it. In fact, he mentions how they're being, bringing people in at the end of nine, for they themselves show us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. The banner that they're holding up is not that they know everything perfectly. The banner I think they hold up is we were able to change. The grace of Jesus Christ is real because look how far we've come. You know, I think it's what you hear in the testimonies of recent converts, that they are so grateful for the gift of Jesus Christ and for the knowledge they have. And they're on fire with that understanding of like, I'm, this is, that's the old me and now I'm something new. And that draws people's hearts towards Jesus Christ. And it's clearly happening here. If I had to give chapter two a title, I would say teaching in the Savior's way. 
I think that's what Paul's trying to help them understand. He's trying to teach us how to be an effective teacher or minister. And then he tells us that basically the way you do that is by teaching the way the Savior taught. And he breaks it down. I think because they're going to experience a lot of false teachers and false doctrines. And he wants them to be able to recognize what a teacher in God's name looks like. And what he describes is basically how the Savior taught. You can go through the verses and see a lot of them. But like in three, he says, For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. As we were allowed of God to put trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. That's what a, a good teacher sounds like. It's the same thing the Savior did in his lifetime. There were a lot of things he taught that weren't comfortable to the ears, but they were true, and he taught them, even when people turned away. you know. And then he had to go back to his apostles and say, Will ye also go away? He taught truth. He taught it with warmth and goodness, but truth. I think that's what you see in the next couple verses. So he warns about speaking with flattering words, that that can't be a part of your ministry. And then he gives these two descriptors. So in 7 and 11, he talks about how it sounds. In 7, he says, But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. And then in 11, as you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. He's saying real teaching, teaching in the Savior's way includes both of these things. It will include those moments of comfort and consoling and warmth. You know, the same way we saw the Savior when Lazarus was in the tomb and his sisters were deeply mourning and the Savior wrapped his arms around them and comforted him. That's a piece of how you teach like the Savior. Another piece is exhorting and challenging and stretching and saying, okay, we're solid now. Let's go forward. Let's move on. We saw that over and over again in the Savior's gospel where he challenged people to broaden their understandings. So I really love that you get both. I think the effect of this kind of Christ-like teaching is really powerful. And you see it in verse 13. So it's for this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when we received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. This is why we have to teach in the Savior's way, I think, because when you effectively do it, what they hear is not your voice, but the words of God. When you are kind and compassionate and also teach teach truth, when you teach simply and without adornment and without seeking flattery or praise, when you teach in his way, what they hear are the words of God and they settle into their soul because you're demonstrating what the Savior demonstrated. Whenever we emulate the Savior, people come closer to God. So I feel like this is Paul's invitation to do that in their teaching. And as they evaluate all the teachings and all the people they could listen to, they're supposed to hold this up as a guidepost, I think. It reminds me a lot of what we heard in conference about warnings not to hero worship others. You know, I feel like we heard that a couple times, to be careful about following influencers or popular, you know, celebrity type people, because he wants us to look for these traits. If you're going to follow and learn from and listen to someone, make sure they teach the way the Savior taught, without flattery, without deceit, teaching truth, with comfort and with exhortation. That's how we can know this is a teacher I should pay attention to. For those of you who wish you could send a care package or some kind of comfort to President Nelson with his back injury or Elder Holland with his health troubles, I think chapter three tells you how. Because basically what happens is Paul is comforted because of the faith of these saints. He sends Timothy in the hopes that he can bring them comfort. So Timothy goes from where Paul is and talks to the saints and then makes his trek all the way back so that he can tell Paul how they're doing. And Paul is delightfully surprised that they're doing as well as they are. You can even hear it in his voice. So he says, But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, that you have done remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, and we also to see you, Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. I can't send a care package, but I think when I step up in my calling, when I increase my scripture study or my temple attendance or do whatever it is I can to come closer to Christ, I think that's how we comfort those who lead and teach us. I think it is, it's a balm that makes things sweeter, makes their afflictions lighter. I think it's something it's a guidance that I think Paul's trying to help us understand that 
this is how the saints help each other, even from leaders to new converts. What I love is Paul sent Timothy to comfort these saints, and what came back was comfort for Paul. I just think that's that's the beautiful reciprocal nature of the gospel, that when you give, you receive an abundance. You never are depleted when you give. I think it's interesting to see where Paul goes next. So if you look in 10, night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. I think Paul is still very aware of the lessons that are untaught. You know, he, he knows how far they have come and he knows how much they have yet to learn and he wishes he could be the one to teach it, but he knows he can't. You know, he wants to take the missing puzzle pieces of their faith and help them put that puzzle together and he can't be there. What I love is where he directs them because he can't be there. Instead of telling them to go just study scripture or just read his words, he sends them on an errand that feels like the Savior to me. So if you look at 12 and 13, this is what he says. And the Lord make you increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you, to the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. I think this is Paul casting their eyes forward, asking them to look forward, and asking them to serve and love in the process. I think one of the best ways we can come to have a fullness or a perfected version of our faith is to love and serve. It's not going to come just in study, and it's not just going to come by learning from others about the nuts and bolts of what the church looks like or teaches. I think it comes as we are on our feet serving as the Savior served. Because in that process of showing charity and abounding in love, you come to understand the character of Christ. You start to take on his attributes and that amplifies all of your study and all of your other testimony building experiences. I think that's what Paul knows. And so that's where he's trying to channel them. One of the podcasts I really like is the BYU Recent Speeches podcast because it puts in my feed the most recent speech from what was broadcast at the Marriott Center. So you hear all these different perspectives and thoughts from BYU professors and from the administrators. And I just it's one of my favorite podcasts because I'm always surprised at what I learn. One of the ones that jumped out at me this year was when I listened to a talk about the honor code from the new BYU president. I couldn't find the transcript yet. You'll have to go listen to it. But I loved his approach to the honor code because there's been some changes to the honor code and he explained why there are changes. He also explained why some things are not changing, but his big focus was on why we even have it. Like what, it, what are the benefits of the honor code? I feel like that's what you see in four. This is Paul saying, in order for you to continue this upward trajectory, you're, you're doing so great. You're coming to perfect your faith all on your own. You're figuring these things out together. And now I want to amplify those efforts. And the way to do that is to channel you, it, to, to focus you in. By setting some things aside and by setting some boundaries and choosing them voluntarily, you amplify the power that God can give you. I, I just think it's a way to tap in to strength. So that's what he talks about. So in one, he says, furthermore, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. And then he breaks down how they can abound. Here are the ways you can speed up your pace. In three, he says, I want you to abstain from fornication. In four, how to possess this vessel in sanctification and honor. This is Paul, I think, saying it's not just about not doing bad things. It's also about being self-controlled. You know, to possess the vessel to me is like bridle your passions from the Book of Mormon. It means I don't just control my outward actions. I control my thoughts and my inclinations. I, I control those things. I have self-control. And six, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such. And seven, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He's giving them basically an honor code to live by. Be honest with your neighbor. Do what you can. Avoid fornication. These are all, to me, the honor code. Why do we have it? The purpose of the honor code is to amplify our abilities. I think you see this at BYU. At least that's what I felt like the BYU president was speaking about, is because the students at BYU voluntarily choose to abide by that honor code. Their efforts in all their other areas are enhanced. They can set down distraction. They can help each other and be knit together in their peculiarness to some degree, and they can proceed and advance. That's, that's what he's promising. So he says in 10, and indeed you do all this. He invites them to have brotherly love for each other. And then he compliments that they're already doing it. And then he gives them this stretch. He says, but we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. 
What's cool about this to me is this is Paul saying, I want you to reach outside of your comfort zone. Your, your brotherly love for each other is so powerful. I want you to take a step further. There's a ministering program of sorts that the, the same BYU president talked about at BYU where people are assigned to watch out for each other. And I loved the way he described it. This is basically what he was saying. He's like, you're good at brotherly love. You take care of each other. Now I want you to watch out for somebody that you may never have noticed. I want you to help and lift the people that are outside of your immediate circle. I think it's what we heard in conference too, this, this constant invitation to like reach across faith, faith borders and find common ground and extend our brotherly love outside of just our own congregations. So he invites them to do that. And then in 12, that, oh, sorry, in 11, and that you study to be quiet and do your own business and work with your own hands as we command you. In this Greco-Roman society, a lot of people saw working with your hands or, you know, being, being that kind of laborer as beneath, you know, a lower status. But Paul is somebody who sees value in labor. He doesn't shy away from it. We know he was a tent maker and that he continues to labor throughout his whole ministry. I think he sees virtue in it. In fact, there's this great quote from Elder Christopherson. If you go on the notes, you can find it. But he talks about how this idea of self-reliance and being able to work with our own hands and produce things gives you self-worth. It enriches your life. It allows you to feel confidence. I think that's what Paul is hoping to, to let them access. You need to work in order to, to find that. If you go in 12, it says why they need to work. I actually like what you see in 12. It says that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without and that ye may have, that ye may have lack of nothing. To me, this is Paul saying, the reason I want you to work is not just so that you can produce things for yourself and be self-reliant. I want you to do it so that you can have empathy for others. I think it's part of the reason why, you know, a bishop in your ward still has a full-time job. <laughs> the young women's president in your ward still is juggling her job and her family's needs and all those things on top of doing her calling. I think that's what, what we do. He's saying, as you choose to work hard, it helps you relate. It helps you stay empathic. I think it's the same thing, that, the same motivation we saw with the Savior, where he chose to condescend and be among the people and live where they lived so that he could stay close and understand their hearts. I love where he shifts gears in this next batch of scriptures. So between 13 and 17, he's going to teach them why it's all worth it. He's going to talk about Zion. So in 13, he says, but I would not have you be ignorant brethren concerning them, which are asleep that you sorrow not even as others, which have no hope. I think one of their questions they were wrestling with is how does the second coming work and how does resurrection work? So this is Paul trying to perfect their faith, trying to give them puzzle pieces that they didn't know they were missing or they couldn't quite find a place for. This is Paul trying to help them understand it. So he says in 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. This is Paul's testimony of resurrection. The reason I think this is so powerful in Thessalonians is this is the first published scripture about this. You know, this is only 15, maybe 20 years after the Savior conquered death. So to have this written in, like, let me tell you the promise. This is, in past scripture, they looked forward to this day where a Savior would conquer sin and death. Paul is one of the first people to write and publish that it has indeed happened. The Savior has conquered death and therefore you can look forward with hope. You don't need to wallow in sorrow like others have. You have access to something better. In 15, it says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto them of the coming shall not prevent, meaning to precede them which are asleep. If you go into the footnotes, you can learn a little bit more from the JST about what this means. This is an idea of like, there will be a coming together. You will see all those people that you love again. You will there will be a, a unity that happens when the Savior comes because he will come not on his own, but with a host of angels. And when he comes, he will bring people up and they will meet in the middle and there will be this glorious Zion. This is the rapture. You know what most people in other Christian faiths call the rapture, this coming together on the Savior's second coming that will be a delight. I just think it's this epic reunion moment. What I liked about it this week is Violet had been watching Relative Race sort of recently. And you know, when that show brings people together, like it introduces adopted sons to their biological fathers who they never knew in their life or cousins who lived within 20 miles of each other and never knew each other. That show was all about bringing reunions. And one of the things I love to watch is the delight that happens on people's faces. You know, like there is worlds open up when you know your family. And I think 
for the Savior who provided this reunion, this will be a day of great joy. You know, to see reunions happen that have been waiting for so long, I just think this will be a day of great joy, not just for those who are watching, but for the Savior himself. The natural question that happens after you hear about this glorious day of reunion at the Savior's second coming is to wonder when, you know, when is this going to happen? And clearly that's on their minds because that's what Paul addresses in chapter five. Actually, five had some of my favorite little nuggets of wisdom of all the chapters in First Thessalonians. So in one, he says, but of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you for ye yourselves know perfectly the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night, meaning it doesn't matter how many times you ask me, I don't know. I can't remember which of the general authorities basically said that same thing. Like, I don't know. And if I don't know, with all due respect, no one knows. <laughs> like, There's this understanding of like, this is something that has been told in scripture many, many times that no one knows the day nor the hour when the Savior will come. But what Paul teaches is there are ways to know that the time is close and they don't, it's not going to happen under a cloak of, you know, confusion. I think the same way when we read the story of, or the parable of the 10 virgins from the Savior, where he said, a call will go forth, that the bridegroom is coming. This is not going to be, the second coming is not going to be announced in quiet rooms, you know, for just certain friends of general authorities. That is not how the second coming is going to come forth. It, there will be a cry that goes out. The, I think what matters is if you're used to listening to the prophet, if you're used to listening to the guidance of his authorized leaders, then you'll hear the cry. If you're not, it will catch you off guard. I think this is why the prophet warned about, remember in his talk where he basically said that idea of eat, drink, and be merry is one of the dumbest ideas. Out. I just, I can't remember the way he phrased it, but it was like, you need to prepare. This is your time. This is your time to be ready to meet the Lord. You need to use this probationary state and get ready. That's Paul's message too. So he says, for yourselves know that it will come as a thief in the night. And then he says, but ye brethren are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, the children of the day, and we are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Paul's guidance is the same guidance we get from a prophet today, that there are signs that you can watch for. There will be indicators, especially as you listen to the words of the prophet, that will help us know that the time is getting close. And man, you hear that a lot, that the time is getting close. And so we need to prepare. That's Paul's guidance. Stop worrying so much about the exact time and just be ready so that no matter when it comes or if death comes first, you're prepared to meet the Savior, however you find him. And then in eight, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and of love for the helm for an helmet, the hope of salvation. I don't think we're supposed to just sit idly by and wait for the day that the Savior will come. I don't even think we're just supposed to sit and hope that he comes. The tumultuous political state of our world right now, I think makes all of us hope that he'll come soon. <laughs> but I think we're supposed to build Zion in the process. The way we do that is by putting on this armor of hope and faith and love and trusting in those promises of salvation and moving forward, despite the darkness that seems to be crowding in around us. Then in nine, I love the way he phrases it. For God hath not appointed unto us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. You're not destined for destruction if you are seeking to come closer to Christ. That's his message. As you're in this discipleship and trying to do better and repenting daily, you'll be where you need to be to hear that cry go out. You'll be able to meet the bridegroom if you just stay tuned in to what the prophet is teaching. I love 11 too. It says, wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you to esteem them very highly and in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. This is Paul's guidance to know your leaders and to trust them. I, I think this is a way that we prepare for the Savior's second coming. One of the ways I think we get comfortable with trusting that we will hear that cry go out is by trusting the leaders that we have and by esteeming them. I like the way it's phrased in 13, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. To me, this is our invitation to not just sustain our leaders by putting our hands in the air like we did at conference, but sustaining them with our actions and with our prayers and with our thoughts. 
there's this beautiful quote in the notes. It's from President Eyring, and he was talking about sustaining and that there's these questions we should ask ourselves about our leaders. I have them in the notes in full, but you can get a, a picture here. He says, have I thought or spoken of human weakness in the people I have pledged to sustain? Have I looked for evidence that the Lord is leading them? I love that proactive stance. Like, am I watching for evidence rather than kind of nitpicking their weaknesses? Am I watching for evidence that they are in fact guided by God in some way? Have I consciously and loyally followed their leadership? Have I spoken about the evidence I can see that they are God's servants? Have I not just recognized it, but have I spoken it out loud to others? Do I pray for them regularly by name and with feelings of love? Those questions will, for most of us, lead us to uneasiness and a need to repent. We are commanded by God not to judge others unrighteously, but in practice, we find that hard to avoid. Almost everything we do in working with people leads us to evaluate them. And in almost every aspect of our lives, we compare ourselves with others. We may do so for many reasons, some of them reasonable, but it often leads us to be critical. I think that's what it means to sustain. This is what Paul's trying to teach them. He's saying, for us to stay knit, it's not just enough to say, I listen to my leaders. I like my leaders. You have to be actively working to help them in their work, sustain them. That means I step up in my callings that they give me. I do the best I can to support their words and to pray for their all, all their needs. I think that's what it means to esteem them highly. I also like what he says in 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, and be patient toward all men. So this might be just me adding my own baggage here. But I think one of the things that's hardest be, to be in this position is when you're assigned to teach unruly, <laughs> those who are unruly in some way. I think many of you have had callings where it's hard to teach those who don't want to learn or struggle with the self-control to be able to learn. And I love that Paul includes them in this, in this exhortation. To prepare for the Savior, we need to be constantly teaching everybody. The example that I found, I, I think it was from President Faust's writings, but you'll have to go in the notes and see it. But he was talking about Oliver Granger. And he said, Oliver Granger was sent on a mission that the Lord knew he probably couldn't be successful. In. <laughs> but it wasn't about the measured success, what he brought back in when he tried to sell off things for the church. It was all about what happened in Oliver Granger. We talked about this in the Doctrine and Covenants as well. But I love that the message he sends in those verses is he says, his sacrifice shall be more sacred than his increase. I think sometimes we have to take that, that stance when we are called to teach those who are unruly or who struggle to understand. It's not so much about, can I see measurable benefits happening? It's about my discipleship. Am I willing to continue despite the fact that it might not look successful from the outside? I think that's what Oliver Granger managed to do in faith. I think we're asked to do that as well. It's one of the ways we await his second coming, to do everything we can to be inclusive and teach all who can be, who are willing to be taught. So you see some of that guidance there. He also says that you should come. So he says in 15, see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. And then he just gives you this bullet points, bullet points of things you can do while you wait for the second coming day to arrive. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. 18, he says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. 19 is one of my favorites. He says, quench not the spirit. I actually like reading 19 with 20 and 21, where he says, despise not prophesying and prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Do you remember in Elder Stevenson's talk when he was talking about spiritual gifts and the idea of the gift of the Holy Ghost, that it is something we have to check? He kind of used this same terminology where he said, don't quench the spirit seek for further revelation, but then you also need to cross-check. Your revelations can't be out of alignment with what the prophets and apostles teach. They won't be out of alignment with what the scriptures espouse. We have to kind of check our revelations and make sure they're covering our stewardship. And, you know, like I, I loved Elder Stevenson's approach to that. I think when we choose to do that and take our, what we think the Holy Ghost is teaching us and check it, it's a way for us to grow in strength and grow in wisdom. And I think that's what Paul wants for them. He can't be with them one-on-one. -on -one. He can't teach them all the things they need to know to prepare for the second coming of the Savior. But he knows that if they will stop quenching the Spirit, if they will lean in and trust the words of their prophets and pray always and show gratitude, that they'll find peace in this waiting phase. I think that's what he comes to in 23. And the very God of peace sanctifieth you wholly. And I pray God for your whole spirit and soul and the body preserved blameless unto the blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
blameless is his goal for these saints. He's saying, if you do these things, if you listen to the words of your leaders, if you support them and lift them up, if you look forward to the day of Christ with hope and power, if you do these things, you'll come back holy. I like that holy in this verse is not H-O-L-Y, but W-H-O-L-L-Y. It's you will feel whole and secure in your faith as you wait for this great day to come. Okay, now it's time to jump into 2 Thessalonians. So this is another epistle from Paul written to the same saints with a little time in between these epistles. I read conflicting opinions on how much time passes, but what seems to be a consensus is what happens in the middle. Between these two epistles to the same group of saints, there seem to be some false teachings that are creeping in. In fact, I think it was in the Come Follow Me manual, you learn about a fake letter that went out. So something that appeared to be in Paul's hand comes to the saints and it talks about the second coming having already occurred. And so they're confused and they're, they're struggling to understand how this doctrine fits with what Paul already taught them. So this is Paul's attempt to clarify and to teach. What I like about this for our day, I think this is going to become an increasing problem. Not that it's not already, there's always false teachings and confusing counterfeits out there. But I think in this world of AI and all of its wonderful potential, there's going to be a lot of counterfeits that come forth. And I think all of us are going to need the Holy Ghost to discern what is true and what is false. But we also need our prophets and apostles. That's what Paul is here to do. He's saying, you guys are young and you can't tell the difference yet in what comes from me and what isn't. Let me assure you what is true. And so then he makes this little what I call like a doctrinal sandwich, <laughs> because he, he basically starts in Thessalonians 1. It's a short chapter, and he starts by cushioning them about, look how good you're doing already. You know, he compliments them on their faith and on their charity and how they abound toward people around them. He's like, don't, don't forget how good you're doing. The fact that you got confused or sidetracked by this false deceptive doctrine is not your fault, and I'm going to teach you truth, but look how much you're accomplishing and how great you're doing. I think that's important when we're approaching those who have questions or maybe who have been led astray by false teachers, you know, by false ideas. And I think it's important to extend love and say, like, look how great your faith is. And look, I know you, the reason you were seeking this out is because you really wanted to know more truth. You wanted to come closer to Christ. I think it's good to validate where they are and then to teach truth. And that's what he does in the middle verses. He talks about the Savior's coming in the future. So he says in seven, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus Christ shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. That is still in the future. It is still coming. And he says, rest with us. I think that's President Nelson's invitation to, I will let you know when you need to be worried. Come and be active disciples in Christ, you know, work, be part of the gathering, help this occur, but don't, don't worry, you know, and then he cushions them on the other side with more compliments about their faith. He also teaches them about what will happen when the Savior comes, that there will be a destruction phase that happens, not because of the anger of God, although it tends to be written that way more in the Old Testament. I think what we learn in the Doctrine and Covenants and what you see here in Thessalonians is people are destroyed at the brightness of his coming. You're going to see it in a few different places, but he talks about in nine, who shall be punished with the everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. To me, this is pointing out that it is not anger or vengeance that drives the destruction. It is, I, I guess I, there are probably many factors, but I really think the predominant one is his goodness. When that much light comes into the world, destruction or evil can't can't survive, can't abide. Remember when we did that object lesson with the magnifying glass <laughs> and we burned that paper because that light came so brightly through that magnifying glass that that black ink on the paper couldn't withstand it and it burned. I really think that's part of what's going to happen in this, the destruction that will come at the second coming, that his brightness simply can't be next to darkness. The darkness has to disperse. And in some cases that means it's destroyed. So you see Paul teaching some of that doctrine here. I also really like, there's a JST that's not written into the footnotes, but you can find it in the Institute Manual, where it talks about how Joseph Smith changed where the word everlasting is in this verse. In Paul's version, at least that's recorded in the New Testament, it says everlasting destruction. The JST changes it to the glory of his everlasting power. I don't think destruction is designed 
to be everlasting, but God's power is. There will be a destruction phase. It's not forever. And then there will be his evidence of his everlasting power for the thousand years that go after it and, and beyond. Violet and I have been watching a lot of Harry Potter since October. We're trying to get through all the Harry Potter movies together. And maybe that's why it's in my mind so much lately. But sometimes I wonder if the reason we love those epic hero movies, you know, Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings or Star Wars, where there's this one person who's like destined to overcome evil. But then there's this middle phase where evil looks like it's about to win and has all this power. And then things come back around and the hero dominates. I, I think that's what we see in scripture, especially you see it in two, because essentially that's what Paul is warning about. He's like, before the second coming occurs, there's going to be a time when it seems like darkness is winning. I just think his message is a powerful one. He wants these saints to not be caught off guard by this arc that's going to happen in the history of the world. And so he talks about it in two, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there be a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Two things he's warning about. There will be a falling away before the second coming can occur. There will be an apostasy that happens. And in that phase, Satan's power will be amplified. Not because Satan gets stronger, but because there is a lack of light. I think that's what happens. You know, we've talked about it a couple of times where it's not so much that darkness gets turned on. It's that you flipped off the light. And when the light goes out, darkness just comes back in. And that's what this whole chapter is warning about. He talks about during this time of the apostasy, there will be a lot of false doctrines. A lot of false teaching will creep into the truth and it will get messy. And then he promises that there will be another side of that. The word restoration isn't written in the verses, but I feel like that's the implication. He says, hold strong. The adversary will not win despite all of his powers. Like you can see him in seven. He talks about the mystery of iniquities that he is working. If you go on the footnotes, you can see this is secret combinations and trickery that happens. In eight, he talks about that the wicked will be revealed and that the, the brightness of the Lord will defeat it. You know, that's his promise. Like this, even though it will look like the bad guy is winning for a season, there will be a brightness that comes that will destroy all of this growth that we saw for a season. And so he encourages them to hold strong and to remember who they are. Like if you learn 13, he says, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through the sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. I think as a good teacher, he wants them to know what's coming. He wants them to be aware of the opposing forces. He just doesn't want them to dwell on those forces. He doesn't want them to fixate on the negative that will happen. He wants them to focus on this bright light that will come to push back the darkness. And so that's what he says in 14. Wherefore, he hath called you by, by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. These covenant saints are slated for salvation. You know, they are, they have this open invitation to come and partake of salvation and to partake of the Lord's glory, which I think is taking it to the next level and inviting them towards exaltation. He's saying, all those things I've been teaching you, I'm trying to help you access that glory of the Lord that will be available to you if you just heed my words, because my words are the words of God. I, I feel like that's his message. And then he encourages them to stand fast during this epic battle scene. Even though they won't live through it, they'll see it happening in front of them. So in 15, therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions by which we by, sorry, hold traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. That's what you do in the stance of the opponent looking so strong and intimidating and growing in power. You stand fast. That's what you see in all of those movies, right? There's that big moment where the small little hero somehow manages to stand fast against intimidating opposition. That's what he wants us to do. I think it's what Paul hoped his saints would do. I think it's what our prophet teaches today. We stand fast because we know the end of the story. We know that Satan will be defeated. We know that the Savior will come and that will be a day of victory. So we don't have to be afraid. And that's where he goes in 16. He says, Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. 
he's taught us the end of the story. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. I think this is the way you cannot be panicked at what's coming, at the darkness that is going to creep in. You establish yourself. You you root yourself in the doctrines and in the actions of this gospel. You learn the word and you proceed forward and you do good work. And if you do that, you'll be on the right track and you don't need to be afraid of all the opposition. I got to tell you guys, sometimes in this week where we've seen a new war crop up in the Middle East and the atrocities that occurred and as I was watching them and listening to the reports, you just feel this heaviness as you navigate your world. There is a, a legitimate fear about all that is bad out there. And I really think Paul's guidance in three, this wrap up chapter to the Thessalonian saints is guidance that fits for us too. Because where we can't solve those problems, at least not individually on our own, what you can do is pray that the work will go forth. I think the best way we can combat the evils that are in this world is to let the light of the gospel roll forth, to stand fast in our faith and send it out. So that's what he asked them to do. Finally, brethren, this is verse one, pray for us that the word of the Lord may be have free course and be glorified, even as it was with you. That's what I can do when I feel helpless against all the opposing forces. I can pray that the gospel will go forth, that missionaries will have doors to knock on, that leaders will be able to access new areas to teach, that temples will be built, that the light will be so abounding and bright that darkness is chased from the scene. That's that's how I can feel empowered. And so then he asks them to pray. He says in two, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. Pray that your leaders can be guarded and protected. I think this is the same thing that the Savior prayed for when he was on the earth. Remember how he talked about his apostles and he said, I don't want you to be pulled from the world, but I pray that evil won't impact you. Like he, he was conflicted, I think a little bit because he was worried about his apostles going out into this hard world, but he knows, he knew he needed them there. So he prays that they will be shielded a little bit. And that's what Paul's asking us to pray for as well. And then four, and we have confidence in the Lord touching you that ye both do and will do the things which we command you. I just loved this verse. I just thought it was so hopeful. What he's saying is like, I see you. We as your leaders see the good that you're doing. And we have confidence that not only are you doing it now, even though we can't be in your ward and we can't see it firsthand, we have confidence that it's happening. And we have confidence that it will continue, that they just know the state of our hearts and trust that we will continue to do good in this hard world. Five, he says, and the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into patient waiting for Christ. I love this visual. To me, it's almost like those, you know, bumpers that you put on a bowling alley. He's saying like, we just pray that you will, that the Lord will direct your hearts, that as you study the life of the Savior, as you come to understand his doctrines, your hearts will be directed towards the love of God. You'll come to know it more clearly because of these guideposts that we're, we're teaching you. And then in six, there's actually a cool combination between what you see in six and what you see in 15. So he says, he's worried, I think, about the false teachings that are coming and he wants to help them understand how to avoid it. So he says, now we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he hath received of us. He's saying, watch for the fruits. If there are teachers out there that don't teach in the Savior's way, that don't teach the Savior's doctrines, who don't you know, align with what you're hearing from true authorized leaders of Jesus Christ, then you need to withdraw. What I think is important is he's not saying give up hope on them. He's saying be cautious, be, be aware. And then in 15, he cushions it. He says, yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. There will be those who I think out of confusion, not out of malice, will teach false doctrines. And I think our job is to be careful and to study and seek out answers on our own and to treat them as a brother. Even though we have to be careful, I think we're never supposed to cast anyone out. I think that's what you hear the Savior teach in 3 Nephi when he comes. What he teaches in that verse is that you, you shouldn't cast anyone out from among you because you never know when they're going to return. And I think that's one of the ways we can handle this confusing time of false doctrines and false teachings is to be cautious, withdraw from those teachings, pull ourselves back to what is true and what is solid, 
but don't cast anyone out and certainly don't call them your enemy. Treat them as a brother and find ways to find common ground. And then he gives you some guidance on how to see the fruits. So he talks about, again, the kind of leaders that they were, that they weren't asking for money, that they worked with their own hands, that they did what they could to sustain themselves so that they didn't pull from them. They didn't seek their own glory or pride. You can trust in us. And then he leaves them with this invitation for grace. So in 13, he says, but ye brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And then in 18, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always. The one of the ways I think we can be not weary in well-doing is by trusting in grace. I think when our load seems heavy and we're struggling to do good, <laughs> at least to do as much good as we hope to do, one of the ways we alleviate that, alleviate that strain is to yoke in with the Lord, trust in his grace. When you partner with the Lord and you take his yoke upon you, you gain his strength and you can not be weary and well-doing. I think Paul knows that and he's trying to help the saints find relief. And that's one of the best ways to do it. Welcome back, you guys. This is the creative side of week 42, where I try and find weird, fun ways to create memories as a family or as a class and also teach the principles of Paul. And since it's October and we're creeping closer and closer to Halloween, you're going to find Halloween inching its way into my object lessons, mostly because I feel like that's a way to show that you can be doing your everyday life things and add the goodness of the gospel into it. I think when you can combine those things, it packs a punch. So let me walk you through our three object lessons in a quick preview. And then for those of you who are watching on the full course or maybe listening on the private podcast, I'll take you through each one individually and give you the printables and the notes so that you can teach them a little bit simpler. So let's get started. Okay. First and foremost, we are making what I call screeching ghosts. So this is a balloon that can screech out at you. And the reason we're going to create this is because I really wanted to draw attention to what Paul taught about these saints. The Thessalonians managed to live their faith so well that others, even outside of their immediate social circles, were drawn in to Jesus Christ because of the sound they made. That's that's the phrasing he uses. So I want to help our kids understand that because so much of what we heard in conference was this invitation to shine out. You know, whether you're in a taxi cab or you're talking to your soccer coach on the field or wherever you are, find a way to teach the gospel of Christ to anyone and everyone who's able to hear. And I think one of the ways we demonstrate that is by showing that small things can make great sounds. So that's the first one. For that one, the only supplies you need are balloons. You can choose white ones, or I like these clear ones as well. Really any color would do. You don't need to go to the store to buy special ones, but if you want to look more ghosty, then you're going to need some white or some clear balloons. And then you're going to need the printable. This is going to give you some faces to pull from to use as a stencil. So you can use this or you could really just grab a Sharpie and color on your balloons and you'll be good to go. The only other thing you need for that one are hex nuts. So for me, the easiest thing I found was to get a combination of sizes of hex nuts. It was cheap. I think it was $4 at Walmart to get a combo pack. You just need a few on hand. You can put one in each balloon or if you want to really make them screech, you can do many and I'll teach you how. Okay, second one. One of the things Paul taught this week is that he was grateful that the Thessalonian saints heard his words and understood that they weren't the words of men. They were the words that God wanted them to hear. They were the words of God. The reason I think that's powerful for us is we just came from conference where we heard special witnesses of Jesus Christ teach us things about God the Father, about Jesus Christ, about how he feels about us. And I think they need special attention. There's a lot of great conference review programs out there. I'm not trying to review all of conference, but I do think it would help to take a little time to focus on the special witnesses of Jesus Christ and what they said. So one of the ways I'm going to help you do that is by creating these adorable little books. <laughs> so, you know, I just, I can't resist when I make something this tiny and this cute. The goal here is that you will have a simple, quick reference that you could pull from over and over again. So if you're in a seminary class or if you're teaching at home, that your kids can easily find the talks that you're referencing. So basically on the inside, I'll walk you through all the details, but on the inside, I have each of the talks by the 15 leaders of the church. So the apostles and the first presidency, their talks are highlighted. You have a QR code to get you straight to their talk. And you also have the tags. So if you're searching for a talk on adversity or you're searching for a talk on tithing, you can quickly skim through the tags and find what you're looking for. So I'll teach you how to make this book and how to put it to use in just a second. 
the third one incorporates a little bit more Halloween. I, like I said, told you in the insights, I've been watching a lot of Harry Potter lately. <laughs> so it was on my mind when I started studying Paul's words in Second Thessalonians, and I started to see patterns. You know, Paul warns about there are good guys and there are bad guys, and the good guys are going to win. And there's going to be a time when the bad guys seem like they're about to win. But trust me, the one who wrote this story out in the beginning knows how it will end. And I love the way he he talks about them being chosen, that they are chosen to work for the forces of good. So I'm going to tie all that to Harry Potter. And since we're talking about Harry Potter anyway, I thought it would be fun if we made wands so that you could reinforce this point. I think this mortal life is a little bit like Hogwarts in a lot of ways. And so we're going to talk about that and make these cool wands in the process. They look complicated, but you guys, they're so fast and so easy. All you need for this supplies wise are some dowels. There are a couple different sizes you can choose from. I really like the ones that are about the width of a fine line marker. You know, if you bought Crayola markers, the skinnier ones, about that width. Um, but you could use any number of sizes that you have on hand. And then you just need hot glue and acrylic paint. If you have those supplies, then you'll be all set to make as many wands as you want. And trust me, you don't want to miss that one. So gather those supplies and then come on back and I'll give you all the details. See, I told you it was going to be a good week. All right. I hope you enjoy this preview to Halloween as you teach some of the principles of Paul and help your kids come just a little bit closer to their scriptures and feeling a connection to them. I think it'll be worth your time in every way. If you need extra help with this week's study, or you just have questions about how to pull off the object lessons, feel free to join me on Instagram. So Monday morning at 10 a.m. Mountain Time, I will come on for a live. If you follow me on Instagram, you'll get an alert that says Mech Mom Life is going live, and you just click join, and you can pop right in the live with us. It's a good place to ask questions or to just be a part of the dialogue. I'll add some of the insights that I didn't quite have time to fit in here and answer questions as you have them. If you can't catch the live live, you also can watch it anytime in my feed for the following week. So if you can't catch it while it's happening, jump onto my feed and you can see it anytime. But otherwise, I hope you just enjoy this week. We're, we're getting to those shorter, more compact chapters of Paul's writings. And I think there's a lot of goodness that's condensed into those tiny little chapters. So I hope you enjoy it and then come back next week for even more. All right, you guys, enjoy your week and I'll see you on Monday.